you did your PhD at the University of Oxford, also with Jeff Arrington. I found this coincidence. <laughs> um, so then uh, you, your first postdoctoral stay was at Harvard University with John Chant, and then at the Massachusetts Institute of Technologies with Angelica Amo. Uh, so from 2005, uh, you started your own lab at the University of Edinburgh and you became a professor 2015. So topic of your talk will be frontal organization in meiosis and Zoom is yours. Thank you. Okay, so I'd like to first start by thanking Jan for putting this um, workshop together and for allowing me to um, be part of it. And a quick advert, if you're looking to start a research group in any area of cell biology, um, particularly chromosome bi biology, then I would encourage you to get in touch. So in my lab, we want to understand how chromosomes are organized in mitosis and meiosis. And today I'm going to focus on meiosis. Um, but before I um, get into that, I'm going to start with a brief introduction to pericentromeres because this will become important later. So pericentromeres are the regions surrounding centromeres that are highly enriched in cohesin and perform specialized functions in chromosome segregation. And in many organisms, pericentromeres are repetitive and heterochromatic, but this is not the case in budding yeast, um, which is the organism I'm going to tell you about today. And so this means that we can use sequencing-based approaches to probe their structure and function. And most recently, um, last year, Flora Paldi, a former PhD student in the lab, showed that targeted cohesin loading at centromeres, coupled with convergent genes that we identified at the borders of pericentromeres, fold pericentromeres into a structure competent for chromosome segregation. So following cohesin loading, a loop can be extruded on each side of the centromere, and this um, elongates until it gets to these convergent genes, which block it. And it also at the convergent genes through a mechanism that we don't understand. Um, the cohesin that is engaged in holding the sister chromatids together, so the cohesive cohesin, is trapped. And this entire structure facilitates the capture of sister kinetochores from microtubules from opposite poles, um, a metaphase of mitosis. And the tension that is generated will result in the sliding off of the loop extruding cohesin while the, co the cohesin that's trapped at the convergent genes um, will resist further separation of the chromosomes. So pericentromeres form a very nice um, um, paradigm to study structure um, and function of chromosomal domains. And pericentromeres are really important in meiosis. So meiosis is the cell division that makes the gametes, um, where two rounds of chromosome segregation follow a single round of DNA replication. And meiosis one is a very special segregation event because it is the homologs that are segregated rather than the sister chromatids, which is what happens in meiosis two and mitosis. And for this to happen, we need several modifications to the chromosome to the chromosome segregation machinery. So, firstly, the homologs need to be linked, and in most organisms, meiotic crossover recombination generates chiasma, which provide these linkages. Secondly, sister kinetochores attached to microtubules from the same pole and are said to be mono-oriented rather than opposite poles, which is what happens in mitosis and meiosis two. And thirdly, the cohesin between that's holding the sister chromatids together is lost in a stepwise manner during meiosis. So cohesin is first cleaved on chromosome arms, um, but pr pr protected in the pericentromeric region. And this is really important because this pericentromeric cohesin is needed for the accurate segregation of sister chromatids and meiosis too. So as you can see, cohesin um, forms a very um, central role in, in meiosis and in these two sort of very distinct chromosome segregation events. And um, to allow this to happen, we first um, need to establish a particular chromosome configuration. And again, cohesin is really um, central to this. So in addition to holding the sister chromatids together, in meiotic prophase one, Cohesin holds um, an array of um, chromatid loops, um, which emanate out from this cohesin-rich axis. And these loops are, are quite highly positioned in yeast, as shown by um, Matt Neal and Ramen Kazol's lab. In addition, the cohesin axis um, is what the synaptonemal complex assembles on, which zips up the two homologous chromosomes. So in prophase one, we need cohesin for synapsis, um, crossover recombination, and DNA repair. 
In metaphase one, at least in fission use of mammals, um, cohesin is important for sister kinetical monorientation. And later in meiosis two, um, the, the protection mechanism is really important because um, this pericentromeric cohesin is the only thing holding the sister chromatids together. So we want to know how cohesin can be specialized to perform these quite different functions in meiosis. And as um, has already been introduced to you, cohesin has these two biochemically distinct functions. It's um, important for generating cohesion, holding the sister chromatids together, and it can also form intramolecular loops. And in both cases, cohesin is loaded onto the chromosomes by the SCC24 complex, which also drives loop extrusion, but it's unloaded through the activity of this WAPL um, protein. And WAPL activity can be counteracted by um, um, acetylation of the SMC subunit of cohesin by the ECO1 acetyltransferase, and this stabilizes cohesion. In addition, um, some nice work from the Peters lab in mammalian interface cells has shown that um, cohesin acetylation can also um, likely stabilize loops. So we wanted to know how these regulators um, could define these um, specialized cell divisions, uh, specialized chromosome um, segregation events in meiosis. And so during meiosis, we see ECHO1 production um, in meiotic S phase, and shortly thereafter, we begin to see SMC3 acetylation. And so um, this told us that cohesin is indeed acetylated during my premiotic S phase. And in, my, in, in mitotic cells, we know that you need DNA replication for SMC3 acetylation. So to ask if this was also the case in meiosis, we prevented DNA replication in two ways. We depleted the replication factor CDC6, or we um, deleted the two S phase cyclins. And you can see that in both cases, um, bulk DNA replication is prevented. However, we still see um, substantial SMC3 acetylation. And this is in contrast to um, where we've deleted um, the cohesin subunit REC8. And you can see there we only see residual acetylation. So this told us that actually in meiosis, um, we don't need DNA replication for um, SMC3 acetylation. So next we wanted to have a tool that allowed us to abolish SMC3 acetylation and so we generated a conditional allele of the ECO1 acetyltransferase and this allows us to anchor ECO1 out of the nucleus by addition of rapamycin and you can see that when we do so um, we lose um, SMC3 acetylation and you also notice here that we stabilize um, the REC8 cohesin and as I'll show you later this is because these cells don't actually exit meiotic prophase and they don't undergo the meiotic divisions. So now that we have um, a way to inactivate ECO1 and block SMC3 acetylation, we can ask how do ECO1 and WAPL influence meiotic chromosome structure and function? So the first thing we wanted to know was whether um, ECO1 could counteract the destabilizing activity of WAPL on meiotic chromosomes. So we arrested cells in prophase one and we performed um, ChIP-seq against the SMC3 cohesin subunit. And um, what, you, what I'm showing you here is a portion of chromosome 10 with the pericentromere and the centromere in the borders are defined. And you can see that in the ECO1 mutant, um, we, um, we globally reduce cohesin levels with the exception of at centromeres, while in the WAPL mutant, we globally increase cohesin levels. Interestingly, if we delete WAPL in the ECO mutant, then um, cohesin levels are um, globally um, increased back to approximately wild type levels, but not to the level of a WAPL um, delete, um, except again, um, possibly at centromeres. And so um, this suggested that actually ECO1 may play a role independent of WAPL um, antagonism. And we can see this quite clearly if we pile up all 16 centromeres or 32 borders. So at centromeres, if you compare here the, the green and the blue, you can see that um, we have very similar levels of cohesin in the WAPL mutant compared to the um, echo WAPL double mutant. However, at pericentromere borders, then um, we see that there is um, less cohesin in the echo one WAPL double mutants compared to the single WAPL mutant. Um, again, suggesting that um, ECO1 plays a role that's independent of counteracting WAPL. So next we want to know what the effect of this might be on chromosome structure. So we performed high C and I'm showing you one chromosome, chromosome 10. And again, the cells are arrested in prophase one. And 
And um, the first thing that you'll notice is if you compare wild type to the eco mutant and the waffle mutant, um, is that we see um, a broader um, diagonal suggesting more long range interactions and longer loops. Um, and also, I'm not sure if you can actually see this, but um, in the echo one mutant, um, the spots and structure in the pat pattern are actually um, much less clear, um, whereas in the waffle, they're much stronger. So we think that um, these two mutations have effects on um, chromosome structure and increasing loop length, but for different reasons. So we think that in eco one, the loops are less anchored, whereas in the waffle um, mutant, they're more anchored. And then in the double mutant, we actually see an additive effect on, on, um, on the long range interactions. And we can all see, also see that on this um, probability curve. So um, if you look at the longer um, distances of separation, you can see increased contact frequency in two, the two single mutants and an additive effect in the double mutant. And these results are actually very broadly um, very similar to um, work from the Beckwit and um, Kozel labs in mitotic cells with the key difference that in meiosis, we have a lot more loops. Okay, so what about centromeres? And um, what I'm showing you here is a pileup of all 16 budding yeast centromeres, um, uh, and this is mirrored. And all I want you to notice here um, is that if we look at this stripe that emerges from the, the centromere, you can see that in wild type cells, it decreases in intensity. Whereas um, in the eco one mutant, and actually particularly in the um, double mutant, we start to see a stronger signal at further um, distances away. So this suggested to us that maybe eco one is not, um, in eco one mutants, the boundaries and borders of the pericentromere are not being respected and um, extrusion can just occur along the chromosome arm. And to look at this more closely, we piled up the um, borders. And here um, in, these, in the top left um, quadrant, so this is all 32 borders piled up. And in the top left quadrant, it's interaction between the border itself and the chromosome arm. Whereas in the right board um, quadrant, right, right lower quadrant, we're looking at the interactions um, towards the direction of the centromere. And you can see clear borders in wild type which are actually much stronger in a WAPL mutant, but these um, uh, boundaries are essentially um, absent in the um, eco one background, whether or not WAPL is there. And we can also see this on the individual pericentromere. So this is an individual pericentromere from chromosome 11, and I've lined up the chip seek traces here as well. So you can see the position of the centromere and these two um, border cohesion peaks. And um, if I just highlight here for you, um, this is the interaction between the centromere and the border, which are these loops um, in the pericentromere that I, I um, told you about at the beginning of my talk. And you can see these clearly in wild type, and they're very strong in the waffle mutant, but um, um, very, um, very faint in the eco one single mutant and also the double mutant. So um, just to summarize what I've told you so far, I've told you that ICO-1 acetylates SMC3 during pre-meltic S phase, and this is independent of DNA replication. The ICO-1 and WAPL restrict um, chromosome loop length, but that they do so likely through different mechanisms. WAPL reduces chromosomal cohesion levels, and this is likely to limit loop formation, while ICO-1 um, we think is important for anchoring loops at, at boundaries and especially at the borders. So um, next, we wanted to know what the functional consequences of this are for chromosome segregation. And so the first thing we wanted to know was whether cohesion is properly established in the eco one mutants and whether this can be rescued by WAPL deletion. And so um, again, we arrested cells in prophase one and use a label either at the centromere on one homologue or on a chromosome arm. And then we simply looked at, the, at whether these, um, these um, spots were um, tightly together or split which would indicate loss of cohesion. And I'll show you the data for the centromere first. So in this experiment, we're taking cells from G1 and we're um, through S phase into a prophase arrest. And you can see that um, in the eco one mutant here in pink, we do indeed see loss of centromere cohesion. And this is rescued by deletion of WAPL. So this is very similar to what has been seen in um, mitotic cells. However, on chromosome arms, we saw something very different. So um, again, in the eco one mutant, we still see loss of cohesion, but this is not rescued by WAPL deletion. So again, this is consistent with the idea that eco one is doing something on chromosome arms that is independent of counteracting WAPL. And we speculate that this could be um, the, the boundaries that are um, 
are generated that we that are missing that we, on the high C map or could be the, the, the defect here that leads to loss of cohesion. Okay, so everything I've shown you so far is up to um, meiotic prophase. What happens when we allow these cells to undergo the meiotic divisions? And um, there was a problem with this, because as I told you um, at the start of um, my talk, the ECO1 mutants fail to undergo the meiotic divisions. They actually arrest in meiotic prophase. And we reasoned that this could be due to the presence of unrepaired double strand breaks, because we already know that cohesin is important for repair of double strand breaks. And, um, and we know that um, when we delete ECO1, this is actually also not really rescued by WAPL. So to bypass this, we decided to um, delete the SPO11 endonuclease that um, initiates double strand break formation during meiosis and prevent recombination. And when we do this, we found that um, all of the mutants now actually go very nicely through, my, through both meiotic divisions. So this tells us that um, ACO1 and potentially positioned loops are really important for um, meiotic recombination and DNA repair to allow prophase exit. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity now to look at chromosome segregation in these mutants. And to do so, we use live cell imaging. So we have the centromere of one homologue labeled with GFP and the spindle pole bodies labeled with a red fluorescent protein. And following meiosis one, the sister chromatids will co-segregate. So we see um, the spot, one spot going just to one pole. Whereas in meiosis two, the sister chromatids will segregate and split to opposite poles. So I'll show you first the data for meiosis one. And um, very surprisingly, what we found in the ECO1 mutant was that about half of the cells split sister chromatids to opposite poles at the first meiotic division. So this is um, consistent with a monoorientation defect in these cells. And this was surprising because cohesin hadn't previously been implicated in sister kinetical monoorientation in, in budding yeast. Importantly, this is rescued by um, deletion of WAPL. And this is consistent with what I showed you earlier that um, centromeric cohesion is also rescued by um, deletion of WAPL in the echo mutant. So what about meiosis two? Well, in meiosis two, as I've said, um, cells rely on this um, pericentromeric cohesin at the borders for their accurate segregation. And we know that eco one is required to retain cohesin here and um, to, to build these borders. And so um, not surprisingly, in the absence of eco one we see random meiosis two segregation, and this is not rescued by WAPL. Okay, so just to summarize this second part um, with the functional analysis, I've shown you that meiotic recombination and prophase exit requires ECO1, which we speculate may be due to um, a need for loop positioning in, in meiotic prophase. I've shown you that cystic kinetical monoorientation on meiosis 1 requires the antagonism of WAPL by ECO1, and that cystic chromatid segregation in meiosis 2 relies on the, the building of ECO1 dependent boundaries at the borders. And so just to return to the question that I started with, and which is how do these two um, activities of cohesion in generating cohesion and um, loop formation um, structure meiotic chromosomes, well, we think that um, both of these activities are important at different stages in meiosis. So meiotic prophase, in addition to needing um, cohesion to hold the sister chromatids together, we also think, believe that you need um, cohesion and acetylation to anchor loops to support meiotic um, recombination, DNA repair, and thereby allow prophase exit. That in meiosis one, um, that um, echo one and um, cohesion acetylation is needed to build um, centromeric cohesion um, to counteract WAPL and build centromeric cohesion to allow um, sister kinetical monoorientation to be established. And then in um, meiosis two, we need cohesion acetylation to retain cohesion at the pericentromere borders um, and allow accurate meiosis II segregation by holding these chromosomes together. So a key question is whether it is the um, cohesive pool or um, a loop extruding pool of cohesin that is required to build these boundaries. Um, and that's something um, we need to address in the future. Okay, so um, I just um, like to thank like all our lab for really helpful suggestions, but in particular, um, this work was started with a really great um, PhD student, Rachel Barton, and has been picked up by a fantastic postdoc, Lucia Massari, who um, has done all the high C and the chip seek that I've shown you. And a huge thanks to Dan Robertson, who has um, helped us with all the bioinformatics. And thanks for your attention.
Uh, Adele, lovely talk uh, yet again. Um, the the, the uh, mono-orientation uh, defect that you see in the absence of echo one is, is, is very interesting. And uh, obviously in, in fish and yeast, and in particular in, in, in mammalian cells, cohesion has been implicated. Um, I think it's not entirely correct to say that there is, um, that there is evidence that it's not in, in budding yeast. It's merely that you do not need REC8. I think this is, uh, yeah. we've always made it very clear okay. that, um, that it simply wasn't REC8 dependent. Uh, yes. And there's never been any evidence that cohesion per se was not important. And the, the, the corollary of this is, of course, is that uh, your data suggests that it is indeed important, and it would suggest that SEC1 can indeed do it just as well as REC8. Yeah, that's, that's what we're testing now. Um, I should say that you know, it's still possible that ECO1 has another substrate, but I feel, I feel that this is quite an unlikely explanation because um, Wapple rescues it. Um, and also because we, we have actually made the SMC3 acetylation mutant. Um, it's horrible to work with. And the problem we have there actually is depleting endogenous SMC3. So we do see a phenotype, but it's not complete. Yeah. So I, I, I agree with you. I think, it, I think it's likely that SCC1 is providing that function, but actually showing that is proving quite challenging. I, I should say that we have uh, um, some mutants that allow QQ to grow very healthily, and, mm -hmm. um, and that, they might be a useful tool that you could use in, in this. Regard. That would be great, yeah, definitely. Because QQ is normally dead, and we have a, we have a, a pair of mutations that allow them to grow really quite normally they might be a useful uh, useful way of addressing this problem i think so yeah thanks